So uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, my uh, very old friend, very long time Not friend, that old. John Lambrinos. <laughs> He started grad school before I did, just barely, but he started grad school before me. Um, so we were, um, we were uh, grad students together, along with Tom Huggins in the background, back over there, who's, who's representing. Uh, so those of you that have come with us to New Orleans, you'll recognize these guys. Um, it's wonderful to have friends. We have family, our families are awesome. We don't always get to pick our family. We get to pick our friends, usually, usually. <laughs> And it's been great that my friends not only are, are good friends, but they've also been fantastic collaborators. So many of you um, have either had the opportunity now or maybe would have the opportunity in the future to do stuff that have been greatly improved and facilitated by um, John and many of our other colleagues at other universities, in other contexts, other NGOs, and it's great. John um, is a, uh, can I call it Rapscallion, or how should I? <laughs> How should I describe John? Uh, uh, very much a renaissance person. I'll say it that way. Very much a renaissance person. So um, we, uh, we were, when we were in grad school, we were in this thing called the body basement, which is the sort of bottom, the bowels of the UCLA biology department where they put all the people that they thought, were oh, these weird people over here. Um, and, uh, but we didn't mind. We had a good old time. And we did all kinds of great stuff. John did, John did his undergrad at Berkeley and then came down here to work with um, one of the um, preeminent ecologists of his day, Martin Cody, who was a MacArthur student. Is he his last student? No, I don't think so. Oh, nearly so, though. Almost his last student. So um, for those of you guys that aren't schooled in ecology, this was the guy that sort of thought about niche theory, niche theory is one silly friend of ours who likes to put airs on called niche theory. Um, but uh, a lot of the stuff that you and I think about as modern ecology um, were birthed by um, John's advisors, mentors, and these folks. And so John came to UCLA and he started working on invasive species. And he's been working on ins invasive species ever since in different contexts. For, for his PhD, he worked on pompous grass. You guys, you guys know what that is? It's, it's the sort of grassy, like thing that has the big, huge white plumes that are everywhere that really began, right, Santa Barbara? Wasn't that the first major? Joseph Sexton grew pampas grass in Goleta on a big commercial scale and exported it to Europe in the, in the 18, mid 1800s. Everywhere, big ornamental thing, everybody in all their, all their urns and their big lobbies of hotels and stuff that are really useful. So he studied that. Uh, interestingly, we've been talking about this, John did his PhD on a military base. And, and I did my PhD underwater, but I would say, I would say, well, <laughs> so I didn't fall in this category, but for our, our colleagues that worked on, a on uh, terrestrial areas, I would say probably at least 60, right, 60, 65% worked on a military installation because those are some of the best um, remnant habitats we have in our terrestrial zone where, where we have relatively intact ecosystems and all that kind of good stuff. So John worked on that. Uh, talked to all kinds of crazy people up at Vandenberg Air Force Base, which is where he mostly worked. Uh, did some great stuff there, looked at rabbit grazing and all kinds of cool stuff. Then he migrated to UC Davis, where he worked also on invasive species, but in this case in salt marsh, in a wetland estuarine uh, context. And uh, worked in uh, uh, stuff in the San Francisco Bay, but mostly up in Willapa Bay, up in the Pacific Northwest. And he decided he liked the Pacific Northwest so much he'd go be a professor up there. So then he left for Oregon State University, where he is a professor uh, in the horticulture department. And at a really cool intersection, especially for us that are in ESRM, we that are in ESRM, in that um, really at the interface of doing, doing applied science, right? So horticulture, using all his ecological knowledge, all his ecological skills, to apply to things like managing creeks, restoring grasslands. How do you, how do you grow enough seed that you can supply the restoration <laughs> community, that kind of stuff? So he's been interested in all that kind of stuff between trips to Japan, working on theoretical models, and coming with us to New Orleans to work on coastal invasions. Um, John has also not only been with us on every single trip to New Orleans, except for the very first one, every single trip. Also, our trip to the Cook Islands, John was a key part of that. Um, and so uh, we, we love to collaborate with these guys. Great students, great program up there at Oregon State. And so John is on a sabbatical right now. For those of you guys who know what that means, it means he just sits around and sleeps all day. It's every, every, in theory, every seven years, we professors got this break. Um, it doesn't always happen uh, these days. But it was, an, it was a time to sit back, 
process and think and take all the stuff you've been doing for the last many years and synthesize it and create some new ideas, new theory. It's important that we have time to breathe and reflect. He's using his opportunity, other than coming down and visiting us here in Southern California, to write a book on the Anthropocene, right? Do we have a title for the book? That's the working title. That's the working title. <laughs> Snap. All right. Well, without further ado, Dr. John Lambritos from Oregon State. Well, thank you, Sean, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for having me down here. It's a beautiful campus. I came with Tom Huggins, who's from UCLA. We drove over from UCLA uh, this afternoon, and when we got here on campus, we were commenting to each other how beautiful um, this whole place looks like. <laughs> but particularly in the campus. And now, I granted it might have something to do with the fact that it's probably the greenest California has looked in 20 years. Um, but I think, nevertheless, it's a beautiful campus. Um, so, as Sean said, I am on my sabbatical and thinking about things, which is sort of a rarity <laughs> these days on college campuses. Um, and one of the things I've been always thinking of was this word, the Anthropocene. So, Probably a word that you all have probably heard because it's big now, it's all big and sexy. Everyone's I think I I think I saw a clothing store called the Anthropocene. <laughs> <laughs> so I started thinking, well what what does this really what does this mean really mean? Because on one hand, you know, folks like us who live in, you know, the greater Los Angeles there or me even me up in the middle of nowhere in Corvallis, Oregon, it's pretty uh, it's pretty obvious that there's <laughs> I live in a completely managed world. Um, so on one hand, well, of course we live in the Anthropocene. But on the other hand, um, it's also something <coughs> when you start to think about all the various ways that we are actively managing and manipulating the world, it, 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 it's sort of surprising actually just how big a role humans now have in this planet. It, I'm always sort of reminded of this great passage in Robinson Crusoe, where Robinson Crusoe thinks he's the only person on this desolate island, right? And he's been trying to survive. He's using his wits to, to manage the world and survive. And he's walking on the beach, and he sees this footprint on the beach, and it like stops him dead in his tracks. And he's like, oh my god, I'm not the only person on this island. And I think, to, to some extent, all of us, all of humanity, is at this moment now where we're beginning to realize, you know, we're not just like big players in the planet, we are the player, the main dominant player in the planet. So what I sort of wanted to, and these are sort of the questions I had when I started thinking about this is, what exactly is the Anthropocene? How do folks define it? What does it mean for different folks? Um, and then, but also, how did we get here? Like, how did we end up at this point where we're currently in the Anthropocene? And that picture I just showed you of the Los Angeles Basin is sort of becoming the dominant sort of habitat on the planet in many respects. And then finally, what does it mean? But more specifically, what does it mean to folks like us, environmental science and resource managers? What does it mean to be interested in that sort of area when we're in this context of the Anthropocene? So that's sort of the very big outline for the talk. I think I may have been hanging out with the good Dr. Anderson uh, too long, so it doesn't exactly follow <laughs> this in a very linear way. So, but hopefully it is kind of coherent, at least. It's jazz, dude. It's jazz. <laughs> All right, so you've probably uh, seen this chart. Well, actually, I didn't know that this, this chart actually existed. There's an official <laughs> thing called uh, the International Chronostratigraphic Chart by the International Commission on Stratigraphy. I didn't actually know there was an International Strat Commission on Stratigraphy. And they're the folks who define all of the different divisions of geology. So this is, uh, they've divided the, the period of time starting from the beginning of the Earth, somewhere around 4.6 billion years ago. The Earth came vaguely solid, it was still pretty hot, all the way up to the present, the whole scene there. And um, they, they've divided it into different um, eons, eras, periods, epics, stages, that basically correspond to different periods in the history of Earth that had unique characteristics, unique sort of physical characteristics, unique 
associations of animals, basically unique ecosystems, thinking about from an ecological perspective. These are periods of time that look distinct in some way. And being geologists, you know, the space sort of looked like a, when I looked at it at first, it looked sort of like a, a layer cake, and that's not, <coughs> I think, by accident, because, you know, geologists, I think, think of things in terms of stratigraphy, right? There's the <laughs> early things get laid down first, and then they get laid on top. Rock layers get laid on top, laid on top, laid on top, all the way to the present. So they're, they're organized in this sort of progression of time. And another thing I didn't really know is, uh, if you look here, so there's this, these little points here, they're called sort of colloquially golden spikes. So there's an official type specimen of the transition in a rock layer somewhere on Earth that corresponds to each of these transitions in the geologic period. So this one here, the Capitanian, which is in the middle of the Permian, has a golden spike. There it is. Wow! And so the, the kind of cool thing about this kind of structure is that's official, right? No one can quibble about when the Permian started or how long the Ordovician lasted, right? They had long meetings, they, they quibbled, <laughs> they fought, they called each other names, and you know, they, people still don't probably don't talk to each other because they decided to put the golden spike in one particular spot, and another, but they resolved that all. So now all of us who aren't really geologists, right, can use this as a place to kind of orient ourselves in the history of Earth, right? So this is kind of a cool thing. And so here's the, uh, Kind of fittingly, the golden spike for the Holocene is sort of a virtual golden spike. And that's it right here. This is the Greenland, the North Greenland ice core. And that line right there marks the transition in um, the heavy isotopes of oxygen and water, which mark a transition from the sort of cold glacial periods of the Pleistocene to the relatively warm period of the Holocene. And that's that mark right here. And you can actually sort of see it in, this is the full record, and you can see the sort of the fluctuations in the sort of physical, visual representation of basically ice bubbles here, going from warm periods, cold periods, warm periods, and then relatively stable periods in the Holocene. So that's one sort of measure of that transition between the Pleistocene and the Holocene. The other one is a transition in fauna. So this is the fauna of the La Brea Tar Pits, the Pleistocene. And just a few thousand years after this, you know, 10,000 years ago, all those megafauna went extinct. <coughs> right. So that's the kind of definition that marks that transition between the Pleistocene and the Holocene. But unfortunately for geologists, well, I'm, I'm kind of generalizing here. <laughs> I don't really know many geologists. <laughs> but I sort, of <laughs> I sort of kind of think of them that they probably don't like change very much. <laughs> they sort of, you know, they're dealing with periods of time that are like hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years. So they defined the Holocene 12,000 years ago. That's when the Holocene started. There's the golden spike in the North Green Ice Core. And then, Annoyingly, things didn't <laughs> stop changing. <laughs> they kept changing, and really annoyingly, they started changing at a faster rate, even faster than the transition between the Pleistocene and the Holocene. And things like, so here's the fauna. So here's extinctions. This is one measure of extinctions. These are actually the same data using kind of two different, uh, kind of a more or less pessimistic model of when you count a species extinct or not, right? And so here's a number of uh, mammalian extinctions from 1500 to basically the present. There's a kind of exponential graph there, right? Same thing, you get climate. Same sort of picture. So this is a temperature anomaly from actual, not from the ice core data, but from actual measurements of temperature, the same sort of thing. It's almost sort of an exponential increase in temperature. So kind of some wag in the back of the room raised their hand and said, hey, so if we define the Holocene Pleistocene transition back then like that, this looks way different than that transition. <laughs> Shouldn't we define another era? And they <laughs> <laughs> So like any good scientific body, they convened a <laughs> working group to discuss this point. So that's the Anthropocene working group right there on their first day, I think, starting to discuss whether they needed to define a new geologic epoch. And 
hope to kind of frame their discussion, they narrow this question down a bit to kind of two kind of geologically oriented questions. One was, have humans changed your system enough that we are currently leaving records in that stratigraphy? So a geologist a thousand years from now can come back and take a core or look at a, a rock stratigraphy and see a point that obviously, oh, there's the Holocene and there's the Anthropocene, right? And that's sort of the first part. And then the second part is a more uh, kind of practical thing was, well, if, you're gonna, if there is that transition, where do we put that golden spike, right? Because we don't want any arguments about this. We're going to put that golden spike and end the argument, right? So those are sort of tasks. And they started looking at some of the data. So here is the um, data for not temperature directly, but sort of surrogate for temperature, which is carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. And this is not from the Greenland ice core, but this is from the Antarctic ice core, which is a longer period of time. So going back 800,000 years to the present. And you see the Pleistocene? Warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. Here is the end of the Pleistocene, the beginning of the Holocene, right there. And then look what happens, boom. <laughs> so that's, a, that's a one of those people in the back going, hey, you call that a different time period? <laughs> what about here? Right? And this, what's kind of interesting about this is it's not sort of, it's kind of an order of magnitude at least greater than the variation before that. It's, it's a really different change. All right. So here's some other evidence. Here's a core. So this is something geologists like to see a core of something, right? So this is a core of a lake in Greenland. And for long periods of time, thousands and thousands of years, you have basically no biology. This is water coming off a glacier and putting in some sediments to the lake. And then all of a sudden, the glacier is melted. And you have biology happening and you have sediments that are characteristic of biological systems. So there's a marker in a core. And importantly, it's not just happening in Greenland, it's happening in glacial systems uh, all around the world. So it's a global phenomenon. All right. So they begin to catalog some various other things that they know are actually making a geologic record. So one of them are, there's a whole range of manufactured materials that are basically brand new that we've created, either from whole cloth or we cause to be much more abundant than they normally would be, like aluminum. Elemental aluminum is very, very rare in the earth, but it's ubiquitous now, right? So this actual picture is from the Cook Islands. Yeah, this it is. is. <laughs> yeah, it is. So this is on a beach in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific Ocean. And there's humanity washing up on the shore of that beach, right? So, and they, in, uh, like that, right? When the first atomic bomb went off, there's now a layer of <laughs> radionucleotides around the planet that you can see in the geologic record. We've also changed the whole list of biogeochemical cycles that are also leaving a mark in the geologic record. This is, this is nitrogen deposition in North America. A year, I think it's 2013. And we've also altered sedimentation. So it's another big thing that gets the recorded in the geologic record. So here's a picture. There's New Orleans right there. This is the Gulf of Mexico. And there's two things here. Where one, there's sediment that's being lost at an incredible rate from places like Iowa and Illinois that used to be covered in tall grass prairie, chrono grasses. Very low sediment uh, erosion rates, right? Huge amounts of sediment are now coming down the Mississippi. And instead of where they used to go, which was this delta, right, it gets shunted out into a little fire hose. It goes out into the middle of the deep um, Gulf of Mexico. So this is an example of two places where we've completely changed the sedimentation processes that had been going on before. All right. So the Anthropocene Working Group kind of considered all this and said, well, yeah, it does seem like we are making changes. <laughs> These changes are very different from the recent past in the Holocene. And um, they are being recorded 
in the geologic record. So it seems like maybe we should, there's probably strong evidence that maybe we should call this a new epoch. And so this was a paper that just came out in 2016, Waters et al., which basically made that recommendation. And the next step, which was, well, when did we start it? When did we put that golden spike? They sort of equivocated on it. They weren't exactly sure. They made a recommendation, which I'll get back to in a second. Uh, but here's a, this graph. Here is sort of just an example of kind of the difficulties they, they have. Here's kind of two approaches to potentially doing this. One is you could say, well, we had the Holocene. It was kind of short. <laughs> Went from 12,000 <laughs> years to now. And then we have the Anthropocene. And then somewhere in there, you put the golden spike. And you can, you, can, you can imagine, like, you can just, yourself, you can think of all the ways, the first moments, there's like the first, you do the first moment where humans had an impact, or you do the moment where they had the most impact, or the most impact that's being recorded in the geologic record. Mm -hmm. All right, like, like, could be another more years of working group meetings and people yelling at each other and never speaking to each other again. <laughs> uh, or this, I sort of favor this one, which is, all right, <laughs> Who actually knew what the Holocene meant? Anyway, that's kind of a stupid name. Just call the whole thing the Anthropocene, right? <laughs> Maybe just change it to the Anthropocene. That might be a simpler way. So they're still working out that bit of it. But from a, an, an, eco like, an ecologist like me's perspective, this is not kind of very satisfying. And in fact, it kind of, in some ways, sort of diminishes to an extent, at least in my mind, the real impact, you know, if you stick this as the Anthropocene, it's called the Anthropocene. Oh, this is another age. It's like sort of the same thing as the Holocene, right? We're in the Holocene, we're in the Anthropocene. It sort of, it's a real profound change which has happened. Not to mention the fact that we're in the middle of it and we're thinking about, wow, <laughs> that's kind of impressive that we've only really been measuring all these things we can measure about the Earth's system for like maybe the last 100 years, 150 years, if you go all the way back, right? And we're, and just in that short period of time, we've been able to measure changes that are significant enough they look different in this geologic record, just kind of sobering. So that led me to this sort of second question of how did we get to this point? And I'll sort of give the answer at the beginning, which is these three things, human population growth, <laughs> technological innovation, increasing resource use. But this is a great example of how bullet points on a PowerPoint slide are awful. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because it makes it look so simple. Oh, is this human population growth, technological innovation, increasing resources. Of course, all these things interact with each other in very complex ways and fed off each other and interact with each other in a long sort of history of human history. And I'm going to be just slightly better than these bullet points and give you go through this history a little bit. But as you'll probably be thinking, it's far from a complete history of how we got to this point. All right. So my one question, of course, I had is, you know, there's seven and a half billion people of us on the planet. There's a lot of us. But relative to lots of other things that we think of as being regulators of the Earth system, like trees, we're like a rounding area, right? So there's probably the latest estimate that there's three trillion trees in the world. You know, huge, gigantic trees. We're, we're like, I'm 5'8", this little guy. There's like only 7.5 billion of us. So how can we have this big impact, you know, relative to something like that? The other thing is, you know, when you think about the history of humans, we have this sort of, it's kind of a, a miracle <laughs> that we even survived on this <laughs> planet. So this is a great, I love this. This is um, a picture of footprints that are 3.7 million years old. Uh, one of our very close hominin ancestors, probably in the folks who were in the genus Australopithecus, the famous Lucy, probably one of the folks who caused these footprints. And just looking at you, you, I mean, they probably weren't exactly us, but can you see, that's like us. That's, that's <laughs> like a group of folks walking on a piece of mud. And, um, that may have only been, it seems, that could have only been the only impact, lasting impact humans ever had on the planet, was those footprints. And particularly you consider, so here's our hominin tree, here's all the other members of the hominin lineage. So there's 
the Ocelopus group. There's us up there. Um, this includes folks like Homo habilis, who were, who've gone extinct, who when they went extinct had colonized Africa, all of Eurasia, built tools, had societies, had, had created technologies, and they went extinct, right? Um, everyone went extinct, all these guys went extinct except us. So like, how the heck did we go from this very low diversity, we didn't really spread out very, very much in terms of evolutionary diversification, how did this one sort of group end up having this big impact on the planet? So the story may start somewhere around here. So this is the footprint as well. You probably can't see it very well. It's facing this way. So the top layer is the heel, and the sort of toes are here. So this was the footprint that was found in coastal British Columbia. And it may be the oldest footprint in North America. They dated a piece of charcoal that was sitting in the middle of the footprint at 13,000 years ago. The rest of the stratigraphy is kind of screwed up. Looks like it says just it's probably earlier, later than that, like maybe 5,000, 6,000 years ago. So there's some uncertainty of that. But these were definitely sort of one of the first early <coughs> colonizers of North America. And they were probably fishermen, hunter-gatherers who were using coastal resources. And to this day, you can find the remnants of their shell middens dotted around British Columbia. And in a cool paper that was just published this past year by Trant et al., who showed that these middens still have an effect on the local ecosystem. So all these western red cedars that are growing around these old centers of habitation grow faster and taller because of the nutrient additions leaching off of these shell middens, which is kind of cool. So there we have, you know, hunter-gatherer folks who are, even then, um, the, they had very low population sizes. And when we think of them having very kind of minimal impacts on the planet, even then we're having some impacts. All right. So here is the famous cave paintings in Lascaux. And so, any aficionados of the paleo diet here? <laughs> so these hunter-gatherers had, were probably really healthy. They had a really good diet that was focused on lean meats, um, nuts and berries. They got lots <laughs> of exercise. Um, they didn't actually have much disease because they lived in small populations. They drank clean water out of fresh, clean streams. No dysentery. They actually had really good lives. <coughs> Except for one thing, which was, it was kind of hard to catch <laughs> these animals. And because, probably because we aren't really particularly good at anything. We're sort, of, <laughs> we're sort of very bad athletes. The only thing that we're really, really good at is we're persistent and we're good long distance runners. So one hypothesis is, so what we did was we just pestered animals to death. <laughs> we followed them, we like throw our throw spears and like graze the thing. And like, argh, and we'd go running off and we'd follow it for a day and like throw another spear and finally catch it. And, like, and like maybe a week later, it would bleed to death and we'd have a meal, right? So this was a kind of viable strategy, but it wasn't all that viable. So relative to the birth rate, which was here, which is about a mom had a kid every 2.5 years, which in modern context sounds kind of really high, <laughs> right? But given the death rate at the time, it was sort of just about above the death rate. So the population was kind of growing some years, but some years it wasn't growing. So we had very low population numbers. The first big change that happened was, so this is, so this paintings, this Lesko paintings are probably, the oldest ones are probably 17,000 years ago. And this is another set of cave paintings in Tassil and Algeria, in Algeria. A few thousand years later, 12,000 years, the start of the Holocene, not in, incidentally, perhaps. Um, and there's a subtle difference in this picture. Anyone see the subtle difference? People. So all these cows, all these animals, cows, or proto-cows, in a row here. Right, yeah, so these guys had domesticated cattle. 
basically. They had become farmers. And through some really cool data um, studies that investigated the demography of graveyards of um, hunter-gatherers versus early farming communities, we've been able to reconstruct the demography, early demography of humans. And this is one of the first big demographic transitions in humanity is, look at this, so moms now in these, in these agrarian societies are now having a baby every three and a half years. Which is kind of, so that's good, but on the other hand, they actually, their lives probably got, actually got suckier. <laughs> so instead of eating lots of lean meat and proteins, they were eating millet seven days a week, 365 days a year, millet. <laughs> Carbohydrates. Right? Or teff, right? They're eating teff. And they were all living in, in close association to each other and uh, putting fecal matter in their drinking water and getting sick. And lots of things were evolving to start eating this human bodies that were now in close proximity, right? So all these diseases started to evolve. So the death rate started to increase. But demographically, this is a huge thing. This isn't sort of generation time. Right? It's how, how early women start having children and how long they have those children. This is a much bigger impact on human population growth than the actual death rate is. And so this, when this happens, even though their death rate had gone up, they actually, the population started to grow. It didn't grow very quickly. It still was growing very, very, very slowly. But in contrast to these hunter-gatherer societies where it was maybe, it wasn't growing at all. Now human population growth started to slowly, 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 slowly grow over thousands and thousands of years until we get into um, this period of time, like 1400s, 1500s, 1600s. Population size is still probably really low, um, but we start to get some innovation in agriculture primarily. So I'm at a horticulture department, so I should kind of say that I'm <laughs> focusing on agriculture, but you should really keep in mind that these innovations are happening in a whole sphere of human interactions. Things like how the society is organized, things like how they keep getting clean water, keep from getting crap into their water, basically. All those sorts of things are happening at the same time. So I'm just focusing on the agriculture part, just to, since I only have a limited time. So, um, Lots of, um, in the agriculture sort of was invented independently around the world in various places. And this innovation was happening around the world in various places. So a great example are the Aztecs who started draining wetlands, one of the first people in the, in the world to conceive the idea that if you drain a wetland, you can grow crops on it. <laughs> Thanks, and, Aztecs. Um, but things really sort of started to, to move along in the 1700s. It's been called sort of the agricultural revolution in England, and it was sort of spearheaded by guys like this guy. So Jethro Troll is not only a, a progressive rock band, but also he was a farmer in England, and he invented lots of cool technologies like a cedar, uh, various forms of tractors that were pulled by animals. And all these sorts of innovations, so not only the technological innovations, but also things like we started to realize that these farming systems were basically ecosystems. We didn't really call them ecosystems at the time. But uh, we started to, instead of uh, just trying to concentrate on our single crop, we started to think about growing them in a system that basically involved growing things in crop rotation, using legumes, using fertilizer from animals to fertilize those crops. We also, there's, the, there's one of the cedars from Jethro Tull. Uh, we also started doing scientific breeding. So we'd been domesticating things, right, for a long period of time. But when you start doing it systematically, like keeping records, writing it down, creating hypotheses about what crosses might do, that really speeds up the, the rate of innovation. And also it's kind of things like having capital and credit to invest in things like a new brand new cedar, right? Um, that involves like having sort of cash to buy it. You know, someone's gonna make it in London and you have to have some way of getting that thing that's made in London out to your farm, right? And then the reverse of that is having markets. So now, you're not just growing food for your family, 
or growing food for your village, you're growing food for London, for Antwerp, eventually places like New York, Chile, right? Things like that. So all this sort, sort of started, to, oh, I should mention, so in the 1700s, agricultural yields in England doubled in 50 years as a result of these things. All right, so there's more food now. Right, so more food, um, potentially more babies. Right? All right. So things really start to go when these two guys had a brilliant idea. <laughs> this is like this is like sort of the equivalent of making money out of thin air. But it's really making nitrogen out of thin air. They have a rush process. So there's Fritz Haber who actually invented the the chemical engineering innovation, right? That only bacteria had up until, you know, for millions and millions of years, the only people had figured it out were bacteria until Fritz Haber came along. And then uh, Karl Bosch, who was able to sort of industrialize it on a large scale, right? So now, the li one of the key limiting nutrients for plants, right? We could just create in huge amounts and put it on fields to grow more crops. All right. so. This is a great uh, picture. It was an article by um, David Tillman. And so this one up here is agriculture or grain yields, not total agriculture yields, but just grain yields at the top figure there from 1960 to 2000. And it's gone up. And sort of popularly, this is known as the Green Revolution. And it's associated with folks like Norman Borlaug, who came up, came up with a whole range of new sort of varieties for uh, our various crops. And but sort of, it's important to keep in mind that it wasn't just that Norman created new crops that were just inherently better. He did a really, really, really sophisticated trick was Haber Bosch had all this nitrogen. And you think, well, oh, just put nitrogen on the, on the ground and plants are gonna grow grass, big. But they don't often grow the way we want them to grow. If you're wheat, you put nitrogen on wheat, the wheat grows really tall, gets really gigantic roots, and then the wind comes down and knocks it down. All right? And in terms of the yield that you get out of that wheat, it's actually not very much more. Right? The wheat is doing its own thing. What Norman Borlaug did was create varieties. When you put nitrogen on that variety of wheat, it turned all that nitrogen into grain. It was grew this tall. You put 20% more nitrogen on the ground, you get 15% more yield in wheat. That's amazing, that's a trick. But of course, what's that then tie your agriculture production to? Resource use, right? Nitrogen, this is nitrogen, water, phosphorus, over that same time period are use. This is pesticide use. So there's always a trade-off, there's no free <coughs> lunch. So you make a wheat plant, channel all that nitrogen into growing grain, it then stops doing things like protecting itself from pests. So we have to protect it from pests, right? So we do pesticides. So this kind of increase in yield has been associated with an increase in energy use, right? To drive that haber bosch process, to drive all the production of pesticides, to move all that new grain that was being produced around markets. Right? So this is basically the same time period. There's 1960. Look at that. Vroom. That same period of time. So Will Steffen, who is a scientist um, who's in Singapore now, actually, he was, uh, I thought he was Australian, but he's actually an American who was in Australia. Now was in Singapore when they got rid of the climate center in Australia. Because there's no such thing as climate change. Right, there's no such thing as climate change. So he turned this period of change that basically started in 1960, when we kind of really industrialized agricultural production, but also lots of other things that we were doing in society that really started after the World War II, basically. He turned this to great acceleration. It's probably a little bit hard to see, but 1960, or it's basically 1950, is this point in the graph right there. So all these red lines here are marking 1950. And it shows you the whole range of, on this side, Earth system trends, right? So things like coastal nitrogen, a lot of shrimp agriculture, marine uh, fish capture, ozone, surface temperature, ocean acidification, 
although show a really marked, basically exponential increase starting around 1950. And then that's associated with what it calls a whole bunch of these socioeconomic trends. Things like world population, GDP, foreign direct investment, water use, paper production. And so this is sort of the, the next big shift, which was this rapid, really remarkably rapid increase in our energy use, our resource use, and our population growth. So here's our population growth. So yeah, this is the start of that agro-industrial revolution. Um, and then here is basically 1950, 1960, an exponential increase <coughs> in population growth. Here is um, this line here is total population. This axis here. This red line is the annual growth rate of the human population. But if you're sort of critically looking at this chart, you might notice that so this is 1960 more or less, right, or 50 more or less, right there. That's when population growth peaked. And Hans um, Rosling, who just died, I think a month or a couple months ago. A couple weeks ago. A couple weeks ago. He would be, he would point to this and show you and say, this is one of the great demographic shifts in the world, right here. It's after 1950, population growth rate started to decline. And it started to decline because the world has gotten a better place in many ways. People now have access, more of the world's population has access to clean water has access to food, has access to capital, has access to housing. And he would, I was listening to a radio show with Hans Rosen, and he, in 2000, he, would, he got furious because the UN still called Korea a developing country. He said, Korea is not a developing country. It's, it's maybe not as rich as Switzerland, but somewhere, it's not as rich, it's not as poor as Bangladesh. It's somewhere in the middle. Huge chunks of that human population have gotten better. Their lives are better. And this population growth has steadily declined since 19, 1950. So the current estimate is that we'll peak at around 10, 11 billion people in the world. But of course, the catch is that that transition People have gotten better, right? Their lives have gotten substantially better. That's a, that's a direct, that's a real tangible benefit of the Anthropocene, of that great acceleration, is that all these people's lives got better. At the, but the catch, of course, is that resource use, right? That resource use is still growing exponentially, right? That resource use, that per capita resource use isn't declining, it's still growing exponentially. So that's sort of the real conundrum that we face going forth. All right. But <laughs> really, what is it? So that's a lot of it. Is, that's sort of the, how we got here. And I gave you sort of the geologist perspective on sort of the things that are getting laid down in rock, liquor, rock layers, right? But, you know, I'm an ecologist. What does it really mean in terms of an ecology or resource manager perspective? So I like this uh, because my simple mind thinks well, basically this is all, you can describe all ecosystems this way, <laughs> right? There's, there's the abiotic part of the ecosystem. There's the biotic part of the ecosystem, all that, wow, kingdom animal, cool stuff, right? But the really cool part is they interact with each other, right? The abiotic part drives the evolution, uh, drives physiological processes of animals, how they look, how they interact with each other, right? But the, the organisms aren't just sort of passive thing there, they fight back, right? They, through their biogeochemical cycles, into the nitrogen cycle, carbon cycle, phosphorus cycle, they process the physical environment, they alter the physical environment, right? And through our engineering, things like building structures that modify the physical environment, we modify that physical environment. But, of course, this, all these interactions now sit within the sphere of the Anthropocene. Now, you could just stick humans down in here, right? We're just another organism that's doing these things. Right? But I think that diminishes the impact that we rely, we're having. Right? So I think it's probably better to think about this as we really are sort of a, a distinct entity that's 
influencing all these, basically, errors. So let's give you some examples, actual tangible examples of these errors. So this is a map of the world uh, that looks at the months that um, the amount of water that we use exceeds the amount of water that's available. And I put availability in italics there because that availability is the amount of water, if you account for the needs of the environment, right? so the amount of water that's there in the, in the system at, and minus the amount that the environment needs, that's the amount of water that's available for humans potentially. So these are the months of the year where that amount has been exceeded. Basically, we overspend that account. And of course, what happens when we overspend the account? We don't let water go into a river, right? Aquatic environments get affected, right? It's a physical trait of that aquatic environment. And you can see, well, here's California. That's that rhythm loud there, <laughs> right? Uh, so there's parts of the world where there's lots of water and relatively few numbers of people, but lots of the world that are in basically water scarcity. Here is another kind of critical part of the environment, nitrogen, right? How much nitrogen is there for plants to grow, right? This is, uh, I already showed you this one. This is the amount of nitrogen that's landing on <coughs> the continent of the US through atmospheric deposition per year. And this is the amount which is leaching off our uh, landscape. And these are profound, big numbers. So we basically contribute half of the reactive nitrogen, basically. The, the nitrogen that organisms can uptake and use, half of the nitrogen, that reactive nitrogen, we made, we put there every year. Think about that. You know, you put nitrogen in your garden, you have a big, you put a miracle grow in your garden, you have a big effect. Think about putting miracle grow, doubling the nitrogen cycle of the planet, the entire planet, not just the little pot, the entire planet. Within 50 years, we double the nitrogen cycle. All right. So another thing we do, we tend to homogenize things. This is kind of a, a hard graph perhaps to digest, but these are these guys, they went, they looked at um, different watersheds and compared the hydrological regimes of these watersheds before and after dams were put in. And then they sort of calculated a measure of dissimilarity or a uniqueness. So you know, sometimes uh, how much the volume of the water, when the water flowed. Each of these watersheds ha are slightly different from each other. And that's one of the things that's contributed to North America being a real hot spot of freshwater aquatic biodiversity, was that variability. And what they found was that when you put in a dam, now all that variability goes away. All the dams, that you know, the, it's controlled by humans. And humans have very, they know what humans, when the humans want that water, right? And so they make all of those watersheds exactly the same. We're more similar to each other. So that's what that top graph shows. So uh, they're below that 45 degree line. All these watersheds became more similar to each other after the dam was put in. This is a control where there was no dam put in. So they're all along that line. All right. We also have disturbance regimes. This is a picture on a particularly smoky day in Mato Grosso. Brazil, Amazon. Here's a kind of a summary for a year average annual fire density. It's fires per million hectares per year. So this is an environment that up until 1950 had almost no fires. There's some, there's debate on what the actual fire frequency was, but there's people who look at you with a straight face and say there's spots in the Amazon that haven't had a fire in a thousand years, right? And that's completely changed. This is now a system that has annual fire. It burns at the same frequency as a savanna does. So we went from, we changed the entire, this whole chunk of a continent was a place that there was no fire at all. And in the span of 50 years, we turned it into a place that has fire every year, intense fire every year. That's a profound change to the system. All right. This is, I already showed you nitrogen. Oh, this is, this is our appropriation of the NPP, so um, net primary productivity. So uh, we, we grow crops, we set fires, so we use some of that net primary productivity. This is the amount of that net primary productivity in the globe that we use. 
on terrestrial systems, and you can see, just looking at these numbers, this is percent of the potential. How much of that net primary productivity that is potentially fixed in the system that we use? And you can see in some places, like India, or the northern part of North America there, it's like 60, 70%. Think about that. So this is the base of that whole food web, right? You know, those pictures of food webs you look at, this is the base, the primary productivity. In some places of the world, big chunks, everything that's right there, we're using like half, half of that net prime productivity we directly either consume or by, for food or cause to be consumed by things like fires or degraded lands. This is the same picture for the aquatic environment. All right. Oops. I'll skip that. It just says that we make half the nitrogen in the world. And we move it around. So this is the flows in, what's that, thousands of tons per year. The top picture is fertilizer movement around the world. This is grain movement around the world. And this is meat. So you know, there used to be a very tight connection between where the primary productivity happened and where it flowed through ecosystems. Right? I mean, sometimes a bird might eat something and fly some distance away, but it was a fairly spatially tight connection. Now, you could grow corn in Iowa, get shipped to a cow in Brazil, <laughs> and that cow gets shipped to England, or the meat gets shipped to England, and some so, you know, uh, arsenal supporter in the pub in England is eating a, eating a bird. It's eating that primary productivity that was fixed in the field in Iowa. Isn't that kind of wild? All right, uh, so we've also kind of shifted engineering. So these are some classic ecosystem engineers who basically organisms that build structures that the structures modify the physical environment. So coral reefs are a great example. Here's some uh, termite mounds. Here's a beaver dam. I'm going to go some very partial beavers. But of course, we're masters of ecosystem engineering. It took me, I can't. I think I was in Los Angeles for, I lived in Los Angeles for about a year before I realized that that was a river. <laughs> 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 All right, so this is just sort of a one, kind of just to show you that we build structures and the structures modify that physical environment. So this is the heat island effect. This is kind of the difference in temperature. This is three degrees warmer at this end of the scale than the surrounding vegetation, basically the surrounding environment. So you can, that heat, difference maps out basically our urban environment. Right? You imagine, so the temperature is a critical thing for organisms. All of that, we've changed the a fundamental trait of the abiotic environment for all those organisms and everywhere that is, is red there. And that was just an accident. We didn't mean to do that. You imagine the things we meant to do, like actually fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere, right? right. So, uh, oh, we, Kind of we, we muddled engineers, so there's New Orleans where Spartina were causing various reasons to cause Spartina to go away. That's resulting in changes to the ecosystem. And then you put that same plant in an environment like the West Coast, it's kind of, it's, you know, it's perverse. Right? <laughs> we're getting rid of it here, getting rid of a wetland, and then we're building a wetland where we don't really want it over here. On, this is Willapa Bay, Washington. This is Spartina, also for the same species, which is the foundational plant of wetlands in the Gulf of Mexico. All right, I'm running out of time, so I'll just be through this. So what does it really mean in terms of being uh, uh, an environmental scientist or a resource manager? I think there's three, I think maybe four. I forget how many. <laughs> <laughs> means I an important number. <laughs> One, I think, is we need, it, it, I think it's forcing us to look more forward than backward. We've often kind of, when we're thinking about things like doing restoration, we often had this sort of backward look. But in an environment where the world is changing exponentially, that may not be the good thing to do. That. I like this. So this is uh, the ecoregions of Oregon. I live here in Corvallis. So I'm in the Willamette Valley ecoregion, level three ecoregion. <laughs> and so here's the description of the ecoregion where I live. It's called the prairie terraces. <laughs> and everything you know, I highlighted them. It's all in the past tense. <laughs> savannah and prairie, uh, fluvial terraces once supported oak savannah and prairies that were maintained by frequent fires. Um, were, uh, winter areas supported Oregon ash and black cottonwood. 
relative prairie remain. So they eventually get around to describing what it actually looks like, which is uh, urban <laughs> centers and farmland, but the very <coughs> end. So I think maybe this should better be uh, uh, perennial ryegrass seed production <laughs> slash urban area is what would be a better description of seeker region. I just, I just thought that's a good example of this. All right, uh, here's another sort of example. People try to do this, so this is a biome of the rule that you probably all grew up with. Here's um, this is a paper that came out in 2008 where the folks reimagined the world as um, anthropogenic biomes or anthrones. So they said, you know, you look out, you know, I, I flew down here and I don't think I saw anything that was natural. It was all human. And I flew down the central, you know, look out, next time you fly up to like San Francisco, look out the plane window. It's an entire, it's a, it's a farm all the way from here to San Francisco and further actually all the way up to, to Vancouver, British Columbia, it's a farm in that Central Valley area. Right, so they said, well you should call that biome a farm. <laughs> Don't call it prairie terraces, right? <laughs> um, so they divided, so basically they said, 25% of the world is wild now. The rest of it, 75% is managed by humans in some way. All right, so the next thing is, given this, we need to focus on processes. And we've, as ecologists, we've been doing this for a while, or uh, we since about 1955, probably the publication of this paper. So this is the Odom brothers who were sent by the Atomic Energy Commission to this atoll in the middle of the Pacific, and we talk, because the year before, the US uh, Army had detonated one of the largest explosions ever, obliterating a big chunk of Bikini, the next door atoll to this. And so they sent the Odoms to uh, uh, describe the reef of this system as a baseline to see if there will be any effect of the fallout from this atomic weapons. Kind of the, iron the irony of this is a few years later, 1963, the above ground testing ban happened and the testing stopped. But a whole wide range of other kind of more profound things happened, like ocean acidification, uh, intensive fishing pollution that have been altering this reef. Well, you can still see, you can see that crater up there. That's from a hydrogen bomb being detonated. But they wrote this great paper. They spent like a month there. They had never seen a coral reef before in their <laughs> lives. They had never been to a Pacific island. And they wrote this paper titled The Structure and Productivity of Windward Coral Reef, where they tried to assess, they followed the energy. They said, how much, what's the net primary productivity of this reef? Is it being fixed here? Is it coming from somewhere else? How much of it stays in there? And they did cool things like they wrote a balance sheet like this was like it was a, a beachside hamburger stand. <laughs> so there's the income, right? Like how much net energy is being fixed, and then the output, how much is going away. So uh, this is really sort of shaped how people thought about ecology, particularly when we're thinking about managing systems, because now we can say things like, well. What, what happened if we, we go from a system in the Amazon that had never had fire before, and we suddenly institute all this fire, what does that do to the net primary productivity? Where does it go? What, is that ha what happens, what does it mean if we take out half of the net primary productivity of the system? What does that do to other things in the system? All right, and this is an example. This is kind of the same thing that was done by Pimentel a few years later, and he looked at growing corn, and he asked, you know, what's more sustainable, basically? He said, is it more sustainable to grow corn in Iowa, or is it more sustainable to grow corn in a little small plot in central Mexico? And he said, he basically took the Odom's approach and looked at the energy. He said, here's how much energy it takes to grow corn in terms of cultural inputs in Mexico versus the United States. A lot more in the United States. A right? huge amount of energy, resources, right? That, the great acceleration. And um, he said, well, what's the energy you get out of that in terms of grain? That's what he calculated here, this line. You get way more in the United States and a lot less in Mexico. And then here's, you translate that to energy. And then here's the, the um, balance sheet, though. He said, well, one way you look at this is say, well, how much energy you get out versus the energy you put in, right, the efficiency. It's a great economic thing to look at. He said, actually, the, 
these folks in Mexico are way more efficient in terms of how much energy they get out versus how much energy they put in. Right? So this is sort of one way of thinking about sustainability. Right? Of course, this I love this example because well, what if you don't use this metric, but you look at this one here, which is the amount of energy versus, versus the land area. Right? So these folks in Mexico, what they're doing is they're setting those fires. Just like those folks in Mato Grosso, they're cutting down pristine forests in Chiapas to grow a little plot of corn. So if you say, well, what's the, the ratio of this yield you get versus the land area? The land area you have to use to get that food? Iowa is way more efficient. Iowa blows Mex Mexico out of the water. If you're concerned about conserving land area, grow corn like they do in Iowa. So, but this is a, there's no answer, right answer there, but that's a way of thinking about how you do sustainability in this context where humans are an integral part of that system. All right, so I'm just gonna very quickly show you this slide. I'm going over, which is the place where we work. And um, this picture sort of illustrates the fact that we live <laughs> in an environment which is completely <laughs> kind of influenced by you. So this is, uh, uh, this is April 25th, 2010. That's the Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill, which is happening down there. This is the spring flood, which is putting nitrogen-laden sediment into the Gulf of Mexico from Iowa. And um, here's where we work out there. And there is that urban environment creating an urban heat island, which is affecting our little patch of the world. And um, oftentimes, I think, just because the world is complicated, we think about our own little patch of forest, our only little patch of ground, and not in the connection with all these other interactions and processes that are happening. And I think in a world in which this change is happening so quickly and this influence is so profound, we really have to be much more explicit about thinking about how these other processes are interacting with us. All right, so I'm gonna go, don't worry, I'm blowing through these slides just to show you my last slide, which is, or second last one, one is take responsibility. <laughs> So some of the poorest people in the world are going to suffer the impacts of us being able to grow corn in Iowa, right? And causing things like climate to change. So that's one thing. But the last thing I'll leave on is just stay out the <laughs> so, That picture I showed you with that, that all those things have oil spill, uh, nitrogen laden water, urbanization. Whoops. This is in the middle of all that. A hooded warbler, and there's me in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Trash bag technology. Yes. So the world has changed. It's completely different than it was 12,000 years ago. It's completely different than it was 50, 60 years ago. But that still means it's a world that's full of biology, full of diversity, and also full of us, which means we just have to figure out how to interact there with it. All right, I'm sorry for going over.